Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's IANA webinar, part of the Intermodal Adapt series. Today, we are pleased to bring you, you picked a fine time to leave me loose wheel, optimizing safety with RMPs for drums, hub piloted and spoke wheels on your intermodal chassis. I am pleased to welcome um, a couple of guests from a web wheel that probably don't need any introduction, but I'll do that in a minute. Uh, we've got Ed Smith, familiar to everybody. He's the senior manager for national accounts. Uh, and Dallas Garrison, who's the applications technician and really got a deep knowledge into uh, what we're going to talk about today. I'm going to turn it over to these guys and they're going to take us through what I think is going to be a really uh, interesting and, and uh, exciting kind of hands-on virtual training session. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Ed and Dallas and uh, let them get us started. Welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. Um, like you said, my name is Ed Smith. Um, a lot of you know me. I've done some training in locations around the country. Uh, I'm assisted by Dallas, which is our technical advisor, does a fabulous job. As I say in all my training, we shouldn't tell you anything today that you don't already know if you're a mechanic. We're here to add some things to your toolbox so that you guys can understand what we're working on, what you're looking at. The industry, the intermodal industry is unique in that it still uses the five spoke wheels, which I'm going to cover that. Uh, Dallas is going to cover the hub piloted, which the later chassis are starting to come with. So we'll get started with a little fact. In 2019, two-thirds of the vehicles taken out of service were brake-related violations or wheel-related violations. It's very critical that you make sure that you maintain your wheels at all times, not only a safety factor, but an out-of-service factor. If you have two brakes that are out of adjustment on a trailer, it actually puts the trailer out of service alongside the road. As most of you know, and I hope everybody that's watching this owns one of these, there was thousands of hours put into this to make it work for you guys. This is the best reference catalog you will find working on intermodal chassis. It has 300 page manual. It covers everything from ABS to lights, to wheel ends, to landing gear. So please, if you don't have a copy of this, pick up a copy of the book. It's also available in an online version for your iPads. Like I said, a lot of people put a lot of effort into this. One of the nicest things about this is one of the programs we were able to come up with is with the training that we're getting ready to initiate and then it's based on this criteria out of this, you'll be able to have a mechanic do annual inspections with less than one year on the job. As you can see, there's two different brands of wheels. The nicest thing about everything is the one thing you don't have to learn the internals of a spoke wheel and the internals of a disc wheel are the same. Same bearing combinations, same seal combinations, use the same amount of fluid. That was for you uh, switching me over to yeah, this. Absolutely. We're going to talk a little bit about, talk just a little bit about the internal pieces. As you can see, this is a spoke wheel drum. One of the big things about a spoke wheel drum when you go to put them back together is you got to make sure this surface is clean. This surface fits on pilots here on your spoke. As you can see, it sets down on. You can imagine if you have corrosion build up, the drum won't set flatly. If the drum doesn't set down flatly, then you actually, when you draw down, you actually cause the cracks. As you can see there, it sets down in there. You have a bolt. A washer or not. The washer is very important. The bolt goes through and the washer goes against the face of the spoke. One other critical thing to inspect is the wheel wedges. Wheel wedges actually wear out. These are what keeps your system tight, the wheel on. It should be flat on the end, not pointed. It shouldn't be sharp enough that it can cut your fingers. And you can see on here, you don't want to hold that. The rim spacer should be inspected to make sure it's not rolled up on the edges. You should take a tape measure and measure it. Your standard 1022 tires uses a four inch wheel spacer, which is measured from side to side. If it's smashed in, it'll actually let your wheels become loose. 
This is your typical yard. You guys have all seen these stacked up everywhere. It's very critical that you make sure that everything is clean. I can't reemphasize how much important it is to not put stuff back together dirty or corroded. If it's dirty or corroded, you can cause an issue and actually cause it to come loose. Make sure that you've got the right size rim spacer for your application. Make sure that you retorque the wheels. It's very important to follow a torquing sequence when you put it together. One thing to remember, spoke wheels torque between 200 and 250. Hub piloted wheels torque at a greater torque. Do not confuse the two. One of the things that you'll notice is the wheel clamps. Wheel clamps are one thing that's initial to the spoke wheel. There are two different types of wheel clamps. I don't know if they can see this or not. Wheel clamps have hub on them. This does not have to set against the wheel in order to tighten up. Clip back over it, okay? Yeah. There it is. As you guys can see here, we have mounted on there. It is okay to have a gap. The federal regulation says that you can have as much as a quarter inch of gap. You should have at least one to two threads extruding from the back of the clamps. As you can see, you try to get even. One of the biggest things you see when you see a chassis rolling down the road is the wheels wobbling. Once you do the installation, you should set something up like we have here to make sure that you're rolling true. If it knocks the sledgehammer over, you probably got it on crooked and need to readjust. Rolling down the road wobbling causes the bearings a bad lateral load. It can shorten the life of your wheels, can actually work its way off. You do not want a wheel off situation with your spoke wheels. Again, inspect your spoke wheels for any type of damage that you may have. As you can see, there's possibility of cracks. Make sure the taper isn't worn out. If the taper's worn out too bad, it will allow your wheels to slide on too far, cause wheel slippage. Wheel slippage can actually end up with a lot of flat tires and actually could actually come off. This is our torque sequence. At every training class that we provide, we pass these out. It's available on our website for anybody that needs to know it. It is critical that you follow the torque sequence. This way you get it on straight and true. If you just slap it on there, you're gonna have a wheel that wobbles down the road. I'm gonna turn it over to Dallas now to do the hub piloted section of this, and then we'll bounce back and forth here. Mr. Dallas. Thank you, Ed. Hey, good, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Like Ed said, I'm uh, Dallas Garrison. I'm the application technician here at Web Wheel Products. Uh, I know Ed went, th went through some of the spoke wheel uh, features and, and the mounting configuration on those. And, and we know that you guys, uh, you live and breathe those every day. Um, we know that's what you're used to seeing. So uh, Ed asked me to speak on the hub piloted section. And uh, I really wanna spend some time. I know for a lot of you, you may not be real familiar with this setup. As Ed alluded to, uh, bearing seals, uh, brake shoes, all that's the same. It, it's really just uh, moving from a spoke wheel to a 10 stud hub. As Ed talked about as well, we, you know, the, the most critical uh, thing that you can do here is, is make sure everything's clean. You want to make sure um, that, that all your, your mating surfaces are clean, and then you also want to make sure uh, that, you, that you use proper torque. So what I want to do, I want to step through uh, the process here for, uh, for hub piloted setups. I want to show you a quick animation to kind of help you guys uh, fully understand uh, how a hub piloted drum and wheels work, and then we'll, we'll kind of talk about some of the features here. So let's see if we can get this short video to work. You see here in this animation, usually when you slide your inner and outer wheel on, it's going to bump that blue brake drum and it's going to fall down to your wheel pilot there. The purpose of the chamfer on a standard outboard brake drum, that is to help the drum center back up around the axle and around the brake shoes. So uh, let, me, let me go to our next slide here. So here's a good uh, cutaway view. 
On the left-hand side of the screen, guys, you have a, an actual hub, and you can see the long wheel pilot. This is where your hub piloted wheels will set. And then you have a real small eighth inch uh, drum pilot. And, and Ed talked about this earlier, no matter if it's a spoke wheel or no matter if it's an outboard hub piloted brake drum, the, the uh, center pilot hole with a brake drum is the most critical feature. That's what's gonna center the drum onto the hub and it's gonna center everything up around the axle and the brake shoes. So we'll, we'll go through some slides a little later that talks about some of the consequences if you don't get a brake drum centered up properly. But, but what I really wanna stress here, as you see on the right hand photo, you've got the hub in red, you've got your inner and outer hub piloted wheels, and then your brake drum is, is there in blue. And as you can see, I've, I've outlined uh, with the yellow circle, there's really a limited area for that brake drum to pilot up on the eighth inch tall uh, drum pilot on the hub. So you could imagine any corrosion buildup, any dirt, debris. That's why we can't stress enough the importance of cleaning the hub, cleaning the brake drum faces before you mount everything together or uh, you absolutely absolutely we'll get that brake drum running off center and, and you'll run into some issues here. So let's step through uh, some of the process for uh, hub piloted setup. So um, the first thing you wanna do is, is make sure you're using the correct hardware. You'd be amazed at the, at the calls we get where guys are running hub piloted wheels, but they're using the incorrect components. So you wanna make sure that your wheel studs are clean, your flange nuts are clean. M M22 metric wheel studs, they use a standard 33 millimeter flange nut. And then sure you wanna make sure that everything rotates well with that washer and uh, make sure nothing needs to be replaced there. So clean and inspect the hardware before you go to mount the, the drum and wheels. You also wanna make sure the hub flange is flat. What we run into a lot, uh, guys in the field, if they have to replace wheel studs, they may set this uh, wheel hub on, on the ground and they'll drop their 10 studs in and then they'll take a, some type of sledgehammer and, th and they'll hammer these wheel studs in into your 10 stud hub. As you could imagine, this the flange on the wheel hub is going to flex. And, and it could uh, cause it to bend there. So you wanna make sure that the flange is straight. And then most importantly, you wanna make sure that someone potentially didn't mismount a brake drum previous to you and damage the drum pilot on the hub. So this is a close up shot of a wheel hub. You see the long ear there where your hub piloted wheels will sit. And then you can see this metal is rolled up here. That indicates that a brake drum has been previously misinstalled onto this wheel hub and uh, a brake drum cannot center properly if, if you try to remount a drum on this. So these are the areas that you need to inspect on the, on the wheel hub before you go to install a new brake drum. Same thing here, I've touched on this. You wanna inspect your pilots for corrosion. You wanna make sure your mating flange, this is where your brake drum's gonna mate against there. You wanna make sure that's clean. I threw in a, a little graphic here. Uh, you see some of the areas in, in orange that indicates it would be uh, dirt or corrosion buildup. You could imagine if, if you try to clamp these wheels together and they're heavily corroded, you don't clean all that off the surfaces first then uh, as this vehicle is in operation, the flex of that wheel in, it's eventually gonna cause some of that dirt and debris to work its way loose. It's gonna leave a void there between the wheels and the brake drum, and you could run into a, a loose wheel incident like Ed alluded to. You know, I, I've talked to guys many a times who, who will say, I've been a mechanic 15, 20 years, you know, never had any loose wheel issues. Well, unfortunately, you know, I get to talk to the guys that, that call and say, hey, I, I had a wheel in service at a truck stop. I'm 100 miles down the road and, and I don't have a hub or, or my wheels. So, uh, you know, it is serious and we want to make sure following these few simple steps, you know, ensures everything clamps to, together properly. So we can't stress that enough. Uh, Ed touched on this earlier. You know, for M22 wheel studs, you want to uh, place two to three drops of oil on the last two to three studs. And then you also want to lubricate between the, the washer and the nut. You wanna make sure that that washer spins freely 
and that, that you have plenty of lubrication there. So um, uh, again, that's important for this setup to get the proper clamping force. You need to make sure that, that, you, that you do use oil for those. Next is when you slide your brake drum on, you want to rotate one of these wheel pilots to the 12 o'clock position. We showed the animation earlier. Uh, brake drums have a, have a chamfer on the inside, and the purpose of that chamfer is so that if the drum slips off the drum pilot on the hub, that when you start at the 12 o'clock position, which we'll get to, everything centers itself up around the axle. It centers itself up around the brake shoes and everything can mate up and rotate uniform how it's supposed to be. So once all your, your mating surfaces are clean, you want to rotate one of these wheel pilots and drum pilots to the 12 o'clock position, which you'll need before you uh, begin to torque everything down. Same thing with wheels here. You want to make sure, just like Ed talked about with your demountable rims, you want to make sure your inner and outer flanges of your wheels are clean. They're not heavily corroded. And then you want to install your inner wheel there on the left-hand side. You want to install your outer wheel, as you see here on the right. And then you want to hand tighten all 10 of your flange nuts and make sure everything's seated up as, as good as you can get it by hand before we begin to torque everything. Here's the uh, torque pattern for a 10 stud hub, no different than a spoke wheel. We have a pattern that our industry recommends. Uh, Ed talked about it earlier. It's in your, your IANA, the, the IRP manual. And, um, and then he also touched on the, the torque as well, the difference of, between torque of a spoke wheel, 200 to 260 foot pounds. On a, a 10 stud M22 hub piloted system, you're looking at between 450 to 500 foot pounds of torque. And then you want to go in this star pattern, as you see here on the, uh, on the right side of your screen. And this is Webb's uh, torque brochure. You can get these on our, our website. Uh, again, this is, this is in your manual if you need to reference that. But what we've tried to do, we've tried to make everything that I just talked about in those seven or eight slides an abbreviated, you know, we're, we're not cutting steps out, but there's a, a four-step process here to try to make it easy for you guys. You know, step one, two, three, four, uh, you've got your eight lug and your 10 lug. I know uh, all of you guys that, that I'm speaking with today, it's, it's going to be a 10 stud hub pilot that you're dealing with. So um, we tried to make it nice and abbreviated here for, for you guys if you need that. So you can find that on, on our website. And then lastly, once you start with, with torquing the wheels, you want to torque them to about 50 to 100 foot pounds in the star pattern. And then you want to come back with your calibrated torque wrench to make sure everything is with, uh, within that recommended torque range of 450 to 500. Uh, you know, a lot of guys in the shop will tell us that our air guns are calibrated. We know we're within that range. But again, in, in our industry, in the heavy duty market, uh, we always recommend that you actually use a, a hand calibrated torque wrench for your final torque. And then lastly, the paint off these wheels, once you clamp everything together in 50 to 100 miles, it's been known that uh, everything can settle and it is recommended to, to bring that vehicle back in and potentially torque the wheel ends. But again, if that's not really feasible, then you can uh, make sure that your, your actual fleet has its own PM maintenance, which I know everyone does. Okay, so um, next we want to get into clamping force and really what affects a lot of that. Um, obviously, clamping force is what holds our wheel end together, and uh, we're going to touch on, on a few slides. You see here pr pretty rusty components. We touched on this, how when you're inspecting the hub, you want to you want to look at the wheel studs. You want to make sure they're not heavily rusty or, or have heavily corrosion. These are actual hubs and studs that we've uh, inspected when we've been out to, to customers' facilities. And this is really going to affect the clamping force of that wheel end. So we're going to watch a quick video, um, and then we'll, we'll move through the presentation here. I think this is about a two-minute two minute video on clamping force. During this laboratory test, the digital readout on the left indicates the fastener torque in foot-pounds, and the Skidmore gauge on the right displays the clamping force in pounds. This demonstration shows the direct relationship between torque and clamping force on a standard M22 hub pilot stud and flange nut. In the first test, a used flange nut is installed on a used stud with no oil applied to any of the surfaces. At the installation torque of 480 foot-pounds, 
The nut and stud generated 27,000 pounds of clamping force. When standard 30 weight oil is applied to the stud without oiling the flange nut, 470 foot pounds of torque generated 30,000 pounds of clamping force. So less torque created more clamping force because the stud was oiled. When the flange nut was oiled, but the stud was left dry, 482 foot-pounds of torque generated 40,000 pounds of clamping force. However, when industry guidelines are followed and a couple drops of 30-weight oil were applied to the end of the stud and on the flange nut, 476 foot-pounds of torque generated 46,000 pounds of clamping force, or almost double the clamping force of a dry installation. By comparison, a brand new stud and nut installed at 467 foot-pounds generated 50,000 pounds of clamping force. When oiled, the same brand new nut and stud generated 56,000 pounds of clamping force at 487 foot-pounds of torque. Since the recommended installation procedures specifically call for 30 weight oil, using a substitute lubricant like anti-seize compound can have the opposite effect. In this instance, a small coating of anti-seize compound was applied to a used stud prior to installing a used flange nut. At 488 foot-pounds, the clamping force was just 25,000 pounds. When the anti-seize was cleaned off and the flange nut was reinstalled with the correct 30-weight oil on the stud and nut body, 490 foot-pounds of torque brought the clamping force back up to 40,000 pounds. In each of these examples, all of the torque measurements were within the 450 to 500 foot-pound range, but the resulting clamping force ranged from 27,000 to 56,000 pounds. Okay, guys, so interesting video there. Um, we, we've actually done this in, in-house as well to verify this, but the thing that, you know, the takeaway here that we want you guys to, to see is, you know, just because your torque reading may, may say it's between that 450 to 500 foot pounds, if you're using old wheel studs that's heavily corroded, flange nuts that are heavily corroded, the wheel stud has been stretched to, you know, past its yield point, to where it can't achieve that clamping force that it needs to. You see the effects here. Look, look there outlined in red, 480 foot pounds, 27,000 pounds of, of uh, clamping force, 486 foot pounds here achieved over double the amount of clamping force. So it, it's really important to use oil on these M22 metric studs like, like it's recommended, it's important to replace wheel studs. I know how busy everyone is. I know how important it is to get these trailers in, in and out of the shop. But, um, you know, this right here really proves that the importance of, of clamping force and how to achieve that. This is what holds the wheel on the vehicle. Um, I think they say a minimum uh, of about 32,000 uh, pounds of clamping force is needed to, to hold a wheel in together. A standard M22 10 lug system, you see you're anywhere from 56,000 to 60,000 pounds of, of clamping force. So, you know, that's double the amount of force needed to hold that wheel together. So um, just uh, an interesting video that we wanted to share with you guys. And uh, I think it really shows how important it is to inspect these component parts on, on the hub itself. This is uh, some, some uh, actual live view or uh, some live customer visits that we've been to. You see, uh, you know, they were going to put this hub back in service without cleaning it. You see we chipped some rust away there. That's the drum pilot. This is the long wheel pilot where your, your hub pilot wheel set. So you see how much corroded, corrosion is up on the flange and, and how important it would be to knock all that off before we made these components together. Same here. This is your wheel pilot for your uh, your hub piloted wheels. And then you see the brake drum pilot there that's all corroded up. So again, those items need to be cleaned before you make a new brake drum to this hub or you're, you're setting yourself up for failure. Uh, ultimately, this is what it should look like. We got the customer to, to clean this hub off and you see the, the pilots here, the drum pilot, the mating flange, all that looks really nice, really clean, and uh, it's ready to accept that new brake drum. So 
A couple easy ways to uh, to do that. Um, you guys may have your own process, but they do make certain tools for this. Um, you've got some tools there on the top left that you can put in a, a, a air gun and you can uh, clean the corrosion and rust off of wheel studs. They've got uh, down here, like in our shop, if we're cleaning up parts, we just use a die grinder with some kind of metal bristles on the end. And then there on the left-hand side, you see the, uh, the needle scaler. Uh, again, to clean the, the wheel pilots off that. So they do, the tools are out there to make the job easier. I know how, you know, tough it is to, to clean a, a nasty corroded hub, but it, it is necessary to make sure that brake drum centers up properly and you and your fleet uh, do not have issues. And then in, in the top right, that's a five in one gauge. That's for uh, flange nuts to make sure they're not bell mount and make sure that they're within print as well if, if you have any questions on those components so yeah so tools are there they're beneficial they do make your life easier so we we absolutely recommend finding what works best for you so this is uh just a, a thin stud hub piloted hub that, that we have on hand uh when ed showed you the the spoke wheel you know not much to it you've got your abs tone ring you've got your wheel studs and then this one has the the wheel pilots, and then I know it's hard to see, but it, this this hub actually has ten pilots for the brake drum to make sure that drum centers up properly. And then uh, we also have your your standard brake drum here. We touched on this earlier. the The center pilot hole of a brake drum that's the most critical dimension on a brake drum. You know, there's a there's a big misconception in our industry. Um, a, a lot of guys will say there's a such thing as a hub piloted and stud piloted brake drum. When uh, in reality, hub piloted and stud piloted, that only talks about how your 10 stud disc wheels pilot on the hub. Uh, the most critical feature is your, your brake drum uh, pilot diameter. That's what centers the brake drum onto the hub and it always has to match. So whatever drum you pull off, you need to go back with a brake drum with that same pilot diameter. Uh, Ed touched on it earlier with the spoke wheel. Spoke wheels have a drum pilot machined on them, just like 10 stud disc hubs do. And, and both of those features are to center this brake drum around the axle, around the brake shoes to make sure everything's running true and you don't get that, op, you know, the, the brake drum's not rotating off center and then we'll touch on what happens when uh, when you do that here shortly. So just wanted to, to show you these two components as well. So I am going to pass it over to Ed. Let me get our video switched. One thing we want to touch base with you about, a lot of people would complain there's something wrong with the brake drum. Remember one thing about a brake drum. The brake drum has zero moving parts. Something has to affect the brake drum. One of the biggest things that we run into is called brake drag. Brake drag is caused because there's not enough free skirt set up in the slack adjuster. One of the easiest ways in the world to measure free stroke. This is a bar here. We have a tool, but you can do it with a wrench. You should have at least a half to a half, three quarter inch plane between the shoe and the drum with the brakes released. If you do not have this, your brakes will run hot and drag and cause you to burn up the drums. Again, it's critical to make sure that you have free stroke. Free stroke is done when you set the slack adjuster up. The little piece of paper that comes with a slack adjuster is called a template. It is okay to use that template to make sure that you get the slack adjuster set up correctly. Free stroke limits are designed on brake chambers. They physically run out of stroke. This can go so far before it hits the top of that. That's why you have stroke limits. Once a brake chamber is stroke completely out, you can apply no more brake force. The vehicle will not stop. As you guys are all aware, different size brake chambers all have different stroke limits. These charts are available about everywhere. They're available on our website. They're available in the RP manual that you should have in every toolbox in your shop. Dallas is going to cover for some frown brakes and brake thing and when brake drums are worn out and some of the signs that you can tell there may be more problems than just a brake drum.
Yeah, so as, as Ed stated there, there's a lot of moving parts in your standard foundation break system. So, you know, it's always uh, important to look a little deeper if, if you are having a drum issue. I know, you know, it's easy, as, as Ed stated, I get when you're, uh, you pull your wheels, you pull your brake drum, and it's either heavily heat checked or maybe it's cracked, and it's easy to just point at the brake drum. Is this a bad product? What happened? But as you see here in the cutaway, there's a lot of things, whether it's the slack, the air chamber, the type of lining you're using, you know, all those things can really affect the, the brake drum. So we want to step through some of those components. On our website, we have a, a brake drum replacement guideline PDF. I think it's two pages and it really shows some of the most common brake drum issues and it really uh, helps educate customers when to pull that brake drum out of service. We all know that, that every brake drum has the maximum wear diameter cast uh, into the outside of the drum. By, by law, that has to be cast in there. So for a standard 16 and a half inch brake drum, once the, the maximum wear is 120,000, so once any portion of that braking surface reaches 16, 620, that drum needs to be removed from service. So it's important to know the wear out of your brake drum. And additionally, it's important to look for some of these issues so you know to when to pull the brake drum out of service. So let's kind of uh, step through some of these. So Web classifies heat check in three different categories. It's light, medium, and, and heavy. Is, is the categories that we classify this in. And, you know, heat check is, it's, it's a normal part of the process. Basically, as you all can imagine, as brake drums heat up and cool down, they're gonna expand and contract, expand and contract. When you have, you know, the outside of a brake drum that, that's nice and cool and you're driving down the road and then, you know, that driver slams on the brakes and, and he starts pumping heat into those brake shoes, into that brake drum, all of a sudden that brake surf surface wants to expand and something has to happen. And what happens is it forms these little small heat checks or heat cracks uh, on the inside braking surface. That's a normal part of the, the brake application. These heat checks, they form, the brake shoes wear them away, they form, the brake shoes wear them away. That, that's a normal part of the process. What happens is, is if you get too many heat checks, they can um, become localized in one area. If the drum is misinstalled, if it's not rotating uniform around the brake shoes, and, and what this can ultimately lead to is a crack. So uh, again, on our website, we have a light, medium, and heavy. And ultimately, uh, we give a, a link there for light. The heat check's about an inch and a half for, uh, or less than an inch and a half, I'm sorry. For medium heat check, it's anything less than three inches. And then anything greater than three inches in lead, Web recommends that brake drum be, be taken out of service. Localized heat checking and hot spotting, kind of, uh, kind of like I've alluded to earlier. These are the things when you pull that brake drum off the axle that you need to be looking for. I tried to outline here. You can see this brake drum was not rotating uniform around the brake shoes. All of the brake energy was, was being uh, introduced into this drum, into one section of the drum. And if you look on this side here, it may be tough to see but you, you had minimal to no contact of the brake shoes. So ultimately that told us that maybe the uh, drum pilot on the hub was damaged or um, someone previously mismounted a drum and this drum, the mechanic was not able to pilot this drum up properly. Um, or maybe they just didn't follow those four or five installation steps that we talked about earlier that, that's recommended in our industry in your IRP manual. So, um, you know, if you pull a brake drum off that looks this way, it's clear that it wasn't rotating uniform and, and you need to dig in, you know, you need to inspect that hub. You need to try to figure out what, what the cause of, of this was before you just install a, a brand new brake drum. I touched on this earlier, the type of friction that's used with, with a brake drum, obviously the more aggressive friction um, is going to cause that brake drum to wear much more quickly and, and you can have issues. Um, this is just from some of our in-house dynamometer testing this is one loop on, on our dyno. Uh, that's 117 stops. And you can see uh, all of these are web brake drums with different, different type of frictions. You see this drum went 351, the second one 260, and some didn't go you know, very far at all. So the whole purpose of this, again, is to, if you're having drum issues, to dig in, to uh, further evaluate maybe what's causing that.
What you see here, I, I touched on this earlier, hot spotting. This is actually a phase transformation in the gray iron of the, the brake drum itself. So for these spots to occur on a brake drum, uh, the temperature has to, of, of that brake surface has to reach 1400 degrees. Obviously that is well over the recommended, you know, wheel end temperatures of, of usually in the 300 degree range. So, you know, something's wrong here. Is it a slack adjuster? Is it, you know, a broken return spring that's allow, allowing your brake shoes just to drag on the, on the brake drum as it rotates around the, uh, the brake shoes? You know, some, something is causing this. This isn't the brake drum's fault. So again, it's important, important to dig in. Uh, bluing, we've all seen bluing on the brake surface of drum. It's, it's pretty normal, but we add this in here. Some of these photos are hard to see, but if you see severe bluing, you see the photo on the top right, that's bluing, and it also has some heavy heat check there. So again, these things that you need to dig deeper into the foundation brake to, to determine what's going on. Same thing with grooving. I know most all of us have pulled a brake drum off the axle and it's going to have some type of grooving. You know, some type of foreign material may get between the brake shoes and the drum itself and it, uh, it will cause some grooving. But again, you need to be aware of those. You know, the, the deeper the groove, that's going to weaken the brake drum. It's really going to affect some of the integrity. I touched on it earlier. You need to know uh, the maximum wear out diameter of your brake drum. And if any of those grooves exceed that diameter, then that drum needs to be pulled out of service and uh, a new brake drum put in its place. And, and all of those things can lead to this. Ultimately, uh, a, a full crack across the brake drum, which is not, you know, none of us want this. None of us want to, to see this. Uh, so again, the, the takeaway from these last four or five slides is if you pull a drum off, and, you know, inspect that brake drum. That's a, that's a guideline to tell us what type of issues the, the chassis was having, and, and maybe we correct those before we put, it, we put it back in service and before something like this happens. Uh, last few slides here. Uh, a lot of guys would go in shops and say they can gauge if the brake drum's worn out by rubbing their thumb across the lip of the drum. You know, that's not a valid way to determine if that brake drum is, is, is out of service. You need some type of tool. A lot of guys in the industry uses a Fraser gauge. Uh, we've been talking to a lot of customers that just uh, use a Y gauge. And basically what they do here, I've told you guys that a standard 16 and a half inch brake drum, uh, the wear out di diameter is 16,620. So what they'll do, they'll have a shop machine this to 16,620. And if that fits down in that brake drum at any portion, then they know that that drum is uh, worn past its maximum wear diameter and it's time to, uh, to replace that brake drum. And then lastly, probably not any of you guys are, are using these, but uh, Webb's premium product. Uh, this is the Vortex. It has three or four patented features on it. We actually notch a groove into uh, that brake drum at the maximum wear diameter. So this makes it really nice for mechanics. Uh, once this groove is worn flush with the rest of the brake surface, then you know that drum has reached the industry recommended uh, wear out limit and, and you need to replace that brake drum. So that's just a few, few different tools that you can use out in the field, but you do need to uh, have a way to check that brake drum before putting it back into service. And then lastly, you know, a lot of the things that we talked about here today, uh, Ed touched on it. You can find these on our website. We have a training site. You can, uh, we have air disc brakes, but we also have foundation brakes. You can jump on there. You can take a couple of different quizzes and uh, Webb will send you a hat. They'll send you a shirt, you know, whatever you select for your prize. So just kind of wanted to throw that out there. We have a lot of literature, a lot of PDFs, a lot of the slides that we covered today is on there that you could, you could reference on our website if you need to. I think that is, that is all we have. How do we have some questions? Uh, we do. And first and foremost, thanks, gents. Uh, that was informative and, um, and, and great to see um, the this, this stuff uh, sort of up close and personal. And I think uh, especially a lot of the, the, the stuff that you were showing us around, you know, what the wear and damage looks like, I think is, is really critical for folks. And obviously just reiterating, thinking that you're saving on, uh, on getting a little bit more mileage out of something that should be replaced is really dangerous. And if you're lucky and you get caught, it'll, they'll take you out of service. If you're not lucky, uh, you could end up 
uh, hurting somebody or killing somebody. So uh, I appreciate you guys walking through that. We've got a couple questions. One of them is in terms of the oil that you're using on studs, uh, somebody's asking, do you guys recommend using an anti-corrosive oil when you're you're putting those drops on the, the studs? The only, the only oil you should use on your studs is a motor oil base. This is an older film that said 30 weight motor oil because it was very prevalent, mm -hmm. but it has to be a motor oil viscosity. 1540, any oil like that. One of the biggest things to remember is never install something like PB blaster, liquid wrench, anti-seed on something you're trying to torque. They have what they call a catalyst involved in it that causes the threads not to engage. That's right. why they make things come loose. So make sure that you use motor oil. You can use 1540. You should have that around the shop for your forklifts, anything like that. Do not use hydraulic fluid. Do not use anything like that other than motor oil. The viscosity critically important and i mean i'm assuming it probably goes without saying but you want to use clean unused oil right and not yeah. not be not right. be skimping yeah. and using you don't, want to, you don't want to change the oil and use the dirty oil on that and yeah. remember spoke wheels are dry installation you do not use any type of lubrication on a spoke wheel only a body got it Here's a question about SCAM bushings. Um, do you guys have recommendations on how often those should be uh, inspected and changed? SCAM bushings should be inspected at every time you do a brake job. The SCAMs can actually cause the slack adjuster to misunderstand what it's actually reading. If the SCAMs are worn out, then the slack adjuster feels like that slack and tries to adjust and cause, and cause a brake dragging issue. SCAM Bushing are allowed 30 thousandths up and down. That would be with a slack adjuster released so that you can move the camshaft up and down. If it moves 30 thousandths, then the bushing should be replaced. That, that makes loads of sense. Uh, thank you, sir. In terms of the things that, that you guys see uh, when you're out in the field talking with folks, are there sort of red flags that you've come to kind of pick up on folks to, to be aware of and, and maybe... Yeah make some changes to the way they're either doing their operations or, or their training? Some of the red flags that I see, and I don't mean to be critical at all, I've done massive amounts of training in the field. I don't believe that we follow the, the proper torque wrench rules as we move along. I'm not sure that some companies just don't use an air wrench, run the nuts down tight and send it out without checking it. Just remember, torque wrench is your friend, but it also covers your liability because the law says that you're supposed to torque those before they leave. If your air gun has been dropped banging around like the kids in the shop, over torque is as bad as under torque. Remember, if you take a pin apart and you find a little spring in it, you go like this, it moves easily. If I take that spring and I stretch it, there's no way I can get it back to the same size it was. These wheel studs work the same way. They have a stretch limit. Once it passes that stretch limit, it doesn't go back. What happens is these pull, they cause a torque. Mm -hmm. So it pulls back and holds things tight. If you stretch this beyond that, it cannot hold tight. If one of these comes loose, the next one next to it will work loose, the next one next to it will work loose, and eventually lose a wheel. Nobody wants to lose a wheel in the industry. No, sir. <laughs> I think it's it's one of the scarier things that uh, that I can, I can imagine. Do you have a sense for um, other things that that folks should probably build into their regular inspection process that maybe they're not doing uh, that would that would help them keep an eye on things and and avoid these sort of catastrophic problems? Well, yeah, you know, as of course we do an annual inspection on everything. I believe that, and it's not part of the annual inspection. But I think the wheels should be retorked at every annual inspection just to make sure that the wheels are tight. Right. Um, walk around inspections, you know, as we go out, go out you know, road ready gates. I think we can probably do a little thorough job of looking at the vehicles there before they leave. I know uh, chassis are in and out, in and out, in and out. I think the industry does a good job of maintaining the chassis. It's like running a 
a huge rental car fleet because nobody takes care of a rental car. Rental cars are allowed to climb mountains. They're allowed to jump curbs. Unfortunately, I believe chassis are probably treated about the same way. So therefore, the maintenance has to step up just a little bit with it. I believe the industry in the five or six years that I've been really heavily involved has came so many miles forward in the training that you're offering, the quality of technicians that are out there. Uh, I'm proud to say I'm a part of the intermodal industry. Um, it grows every day. At one time, it was scary to see an intermodal chassis go down the road because it looked like the wheels were going to fall off. <laughs> We moved so far forward that I think we're doing a really great job out. You know, as we bring more and more people into the industry, we need new technicians. Uh, Ianna's working on a training program. We provide, web provides in-shop training for you. Um, I think I've already done four or five this year for intermodal locations. Mm -hmm. uh, if you would like in-shop training, contact me. We'll get something set up for you. That's great. That's a, that's a great resource, Ed. Here's a, a question on that, the, the conversation we were having around torque and the importance of, uh, of proper torque. And I, and I like that. It's kind of a, we need shirts made, you know, torque wrenches are friend. Cordless impact wrenches. Um, apparently, there's some R&D going on using cordless impact wrenches that have a torque valve that's built in uh, for changing tires and, and similar things. Have, have you come across any of those? Yes, I have. I've worked with a couple companies. Um, Hydro track, some of those. Those are fabulous wrenches. They work well. Uh, you have to make sure they stay maintain their torque ability. But one of the nice things about it is even the new ones have digital readouts. They'll actually Bluetooth to uh, your phone or your laptop and actually put the torque rating right on the RO you're working on, which wow. is a safety valve factor for the um, the M and R bit. I mean, the m and vendor can say, here's exactly what we torqued this wheel at. Right. So they're expensive. They're not cheap. I mean, we're talking three or $4,000 for these wrenches. But if we're taking care of the last three years, it removes all the liability out of it. You can prove in a second that you torqued the wheels. That makes a lot of sense. And I think it only takes but one horrible failure. That amount of money is kind of, well, the national average for one wheel off with a fatality is now fifteen million dollars. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 pretty frightening. Um, here's a good question around proper lubrication uh, and the use of of oil in, in grease. Do you have any uh, recommendations on the best way to to do proper lubrication and? If we're talking about lubrication in the hubs, because intermodal chassis are stacked. And because they sit around, you know, of course now nothing's sitting around. <laughs> I recommend you either use semi-fluid grease or you use grease itself. Oil tends to cause a leak. Of course, once you get a leak, it seeps, runs down on the hub, you have an issue. Right. So semi-fluid or synthetic grease or grease pack is the best way to go for antibiotics. That's super. You know, I, I, I really appreciate you guys uh, taking the time today. And, uh, and, and walking us through this. I think there's really nothing more valuable than, than seeing you guys uh, handle the equipment and, and walk us through what we really need to see to understand. And I, I think it's, uh, yeah. it's critical. You can and I, or did you? <laughs> I tell you what, Ed, you clearly been, been spending a lot of time at the gym to be able to pick one of those up because because uh, you know my, my understanding is they, they weigh a little bit and uh, you seem to be not even breaking a sweat picking that thing up. That's pretty impressive. I do want to, to thank you guys uh, for your time. I'd like to thank everybody who joined us for, uh, for, for spending time with us. We really appreciate it. For, for more info on other uh, opportunities that, that we put out there for, uh, for education, head over to the intermodal.org website. Look at the education tab. We've got a lot of stuff under our Intermodal Adapts program that, that we're putting out throughout the rest of the year. We also want to... Um, thank everybody who's already signed up for Expo, but I do want to encourage folks, Expo is back on this September, the 12th through the 14th in Long Beach, California. Registration is available currently, so if you head over to intermodalexpo.com and get all the info there. And then one last piece is um, Ed did mention the Chassis Mechanics Guide that 
he and a number of, uh, of his colleagues uh, on the MNR committee uh, led by Marty Summers from CCM helped put together. And it was a lot of work. It was multiple years. It was thousands of hours of member input into an incredibly valuable resource that, as Ed said, should be in everybody's toolbox. So I would encourage you to head over to intermodal.org and check out the chassis mechanics guide as well. Uh, but with that, I will say, everyone, thank you so much for spending time with us today uh, at, at IANA, the connecting force behind Intermodal Freight. 